government problem has been solved with government band-aid, which has been solved by government band-aid. So if you pull off government band-aid, you have three more broken band-aids underneath it that sometimes make things worse. The EPA was not meant to go out and, and harass Oregonians and, and murder o Oregonians. What you're inferring is, you know what? If we legalize heroin tomorrow, everybody's going to use heroin. How many people here would use heroin if it was legal? I bet nobody would put their hand, oh yeah, I need the government to take care of me. I don't want to use heroin, so I need these laws. Hello there, welcome to the Logan for Liberty podcast. I'm coming at you from the Pacific Northwest, where the sun shines so bright, only to rain just a few hours later. And to uh, talk about that, um, it definitely has been wet outside. It has been a wet season, not a wet season, but a wet couple of days. You see where I'm from, at, at least the last couple of days, you'll... You'll have it to where there's, you know, there's no heavy gray clouds drifting above. And then all of a sudden, you know, a big, big onslaught of gray, heavy clouds passes by because it gets dim outside. Your entire house or home completely dims especially during the daytime you know you tend to not use lights electricity because you have the natural light from outside it all of a sudden gets dark and it slowly starts to sprinkle and then all of a sudden it is incessantly raining it is pouring down rain and then it slightly gets lighter the rain lightens up, or the rain will just completely stop as soon as the cloud drifts right over, and then the sun pops out. So basically, it's it's uh, three cycles that is in a constant, sorry, it's three periods, trimesters, that are in a constant cycle. A little bit of sun until the clouds start drifting in front of the sun, and it sprinkles a little bit, and then the heavier the cloud gets, the harder it rains, and then the sun pops out again. So th it's doing that all day. So if you live in this area or you're visiting this area, it's probably best to wear adaptable clothing. So if you're going out, you might want a rain jacket, a hoodie, and a t-shirt, and of course jeans. Or if you don't want to wear layers, a sweatshirt and a rain jacket. Because... It might be 50 to, sorry, it might be 45 to maybe 65 degrees outside. And then all of a sudden it'll shift up. It'll instantly go into the mid to high 70s, low 80s. And then it'll drop back down. And I know uh, 80s, low 80s isn't hot. But when you just got used to, your body just adapted to 50s to a mid 60 80 feels pretty damn warm and it feels muggy outside and it is muggy outside because i we live right next to the ocean where we live there's a lot of rain so there's always moisture in the atmosphere so the humidity is pretty high out here but uh if this is your first time joining the logan for liberty podcast let me tell you what I am all about. I am about individualism, free markets, tolerance, peace, not the not the uh, social justice warrior interpretation of tolerance. Limited government, natural law, the scientific method, and decentralization. And basically what that translates into is that I believe in natural rights, individual rights, negative rights, and property rights. And I feel as if those four things are the perfect pillars for the foundation of what I believe would lead to a prosperous 
and peaceful society where individuals are free. So basically, I believe you ought to live incessantly free of authoritarian cultivated agony. And I believe mob rule of the majority does not justify usurpation of personal autonomy. It is important to be cognizant of the fact that personal autonomy grants the individual the right to cogitate topics that society might chastise or at least find boorish. Which leads me to this show. I have to, or at least I feel an obligation to do this show. I need to peddle these ideas that I feel are essential to human edification. I want to foster ideas of liberty. I want to see a paradigm of human flourishing methodically integrate into our epistemology and ethics. I want to um, cultivate a culture that reveres individualism, free markets, peace, uh, free speech, open and honest dialogue. Freedom is inexorable, so I think we should stop fighting it. And talking about freedom, there is this article that I want to read and analyze, written by Kelly Paul, and if you don't know who Kelly Paul is, she is the wife of Senator and Dr. Ron Paul, no, sorry, excuse me, wrong Paul, um, she is the wife of Senator and Dr. Ryan DePaul, who is Ron Paul's son. And if you don't know who Ron Paul is, Ron Paul was a former congressman, um, a two-time congressman, not two times elected, but uh, he had two uh, um, I don't know what the word would be, two uh, stints in Congress. He was elected to Congress for the first time in 1976. He ran in 1974, lost back when Texas was still a Democratic state. Only three of, I believe, 24 congressmen in that state were Republicans. Ron Paul was running in a district that had never before been controlled by a Republican. He ran in 1994. Sorry, in uh, 1974, he lost, and then in the special election, he won in 1976. And then I believe Ran Ron Paul, sorry, I keep mixing them up. Ron Paul left Congress in 1984. I believe it was a 10 year stint. It was either 1984 or 1986, I don't remember the exact detail, and then Ron Paul retired from Congress initially after, I believe, a lost bid for the Senate. He returned to his medical practice, um, and then he ran for president in 1988 on the Libertarian Party ticket, and then eventually he joined Congress back in the 90s again up until 2012 when he retired. But Rand Paul uh, came, came in with the Tea Party movement and was definitely inspired by his father, Ron Paul. So Ron Paul is currently the senator from Kentucky. Um, he, he was part of the initial Tea Party movement, not the authoritarian Tea Party movement that kind of hijacked the original Tea Party movement. But he was brought in to balance the budget, limit the government in the foreign wars, in the bailouts. And so on. That was kind of a tangent, but we have this article that was published on Kentucky.com. It's an op-ed article. And the title is, We Must Focus on Recovery, Not Incarceration. By Kelly Ashby Paul. And this article was published on September 10th. I've had it in my possession for the last couple days. I just haven't been able to 
make this podcast. So I'm here to impart some knowledge on this article, or not not knowledge, but impart some vigorous analysis on this article. Um, so yeah, without further ado, oh, so, so obviously Kelly Paul is the daughter-in-law of Ron Paul. So she begins, recently I was honored to be part of a very special event celebrating the expansion of the Hope Center Women's Recovery Facility in Lexington. Many incredible leaders took part in this event, but the most memorable voice came from a woman named Carrie who had sought refuge. Carrie told her story of rehabilitation and redemption with incredible poise and grace, and spoke from the heart without notes about her struggle with addiction and her journey to recovery, and she credits the Hope Center for it. As a community, as a state, and as a nation, we must speak out in favor of expanded rehabilitation opportunities for those struggling with addiction. Because of the Hope Center's expansion, even more women like Carrie will have the tools to overcome addiction and begin a new path forward in life. It is recovery, not incarceration, incarceration, which allows people to become productive members of society, citizens with jobs and families who can contribute to make our communities better places to work, grow, and live. It is recovery, not incarceration, which brings hope and peace into the lives of thousands of Americans and their families struggling with addiction. The Hope Center expansion comes on the heels of of the enactment of the first ever dignity bill in the nation right here in Kentucky because of Senator Julia Rack Adams sponsorship of the bill and the tenacity of women leaders on both sides of the aisle pregnant women accused of minor nonviolent crimes now have the option to enter a recovery program they can get the treatment they need instead of languishing behind bars because they are unable to make bail. Criminal justice reform is something my husband, U.S. Senator Ryan Paul, has been fighting for since he arrived in Washington. He is a lead co-sponsor of bipartisan bail reform legislation with Senator Kamala Harris and with the recent introduction of the First Step Act, a major bipartisan prison reform bill that includes expanded treatment opportunities. I am hopeful we can continue our efforts to fix the broken system. I am proud to assure the people of this commonwealth that my family will do everything we can to ensure that the First Step Act will get a vote. Criminal justice reform goes hand in hand with reducing homelessness, alcoholism, and drug addiction. We have learned that locking people up who are in need of treatment is not the answer. The U.S. is the most heavily incarcerated country in the developed world, and many of those incarcerated have suffered a trauma such as sexual or physical abuse which led to addiction and ultimately led them to our justice system. Instead of treating these individuals, we toss them behind bars where their problems only get worse. This cycle of failure results in staggering financial costs to the taxpayer, but more importantly, a devastating cost to families and children. The number of women, many of whom are mothers, behind bars has increased by more than 700% since 1980. I am so grateful that the Coalition for Public Safety, an organization that I have become close to, could be part of the expansion of the Hope Center, and I pledge to advocate for policies that ensure more women have access to hope. I am also grateful for pillars of our community like... Mira Ball and her late husband Don, who have done so much to make the Hope Center and all the promise it represents a reality. I was honored to meet their daughter-in-law Linda during my visit to the Hope Center, and I couldn't help but think how lucky Lexington is to have the Ball family and others who had the courage and the heart to step out and shine a light on the despair of addiction long before anyone else was talking about it. Because of this work, the world is wide open for Carrie. I so look forward to what the future holds for this woman, who is now confident and job ready. 
Some in the room even suggested she run for public office. Without the support of without the support and programming of the Hope Center, we may never have seen all of her potential. Helping Carrie ultimately helps all of us because she will become independent and make better choices. It's also simply the right thing to do. In the words of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, my humanity is bound up in yours. For we can only be human together. So, before I give my thoughts on this article and the words that Kelly Paul chose to write and to share with the public, there is one thing I want to say about Rand Paul. And I don't mean to um, take away any credibility or uh, praise that Kelly Paul deserves by talking about her husband, Rand Paul, because they are two separate individuals, obviously. And I don't think Rand Paul is more important just because he's a man. But Rand Paul is a figure that is sort of controversial among the libertarian movement. Kind of for good reason, I suppose. Depending on the libertarian that you ask, or constitutionalist, I guess. Um, but depending on the libertarian that you ask, they either love him, hate him, or have mixed feelings about him. I personally love Rand Paul. Not, not in like the way that I would like love my parents or my friends or whatnot, but I guess I should say I am, I admire Ryan Paul and the work that he does. Obviously, he has some delineations to what most libertarians would like. Although, if you ask a libertarian why they oppose Rand Paul or don't like Rand Paul, you're not going to get consistent answers because, um, I, I, I guess. The consistency would come from the more radical anarcho-capitalists that are more skeptical of Rand Paul, but even they're not entirely consistent because, you know, they, they, they'll praise other people who aren't entirely pure, but my criticism more or less goes to the pragmatists of the libertarian movement, the same type of people who praise somebody like Justin Amash, but they're, for some reason, taken back by Rand Paul. Even though Justin Amash and Rand Paul, when you look at it issue by issue, they line up almost exactly the same. And they're actually really good friends in the Congress. Senator Rand Paul and Congressman Justin Amash both agree on the fact that we need some type of borders, even if they're not anti-immigration like some other people are. They support immigration. They think that the border needs security. They don't believe in the wall, but they believe in border security. They believe in a strong national defense, not a national offense that's constantly in war. They're not neocons. They both hold pro-life positions. But not only are these pragmatists that hate Rand Paul, the type of people that would hate or that praise Justin Amash, they're also the same type of people that would praise Gary Johnson, which I understand if you praise Gary Johnson. I kind of like Gary Johnson. I like 2012 Gary Johnson more so than 2016 pandering Gary Johnson. I hope Gary Johnson wins the Senate race in New Mexico. By the way, Rand Paul endorsed Gary Johnson for the Senate race. In New Mexico. But they also praise people like Bill Weld. Which is unbelievable to me. And I'm not going to go into that tangent. Because that's not what this is about. I'm just pointing out the fact that there are disagreements among libertarians. Who like. Or about Rand Paul. Typically. Um, the liberty minded libertarians I guess who are more associated with the Republican Liberty Caucus will have a more favorable view of Rand Paul, while those in the Libertarian Party m more often or more so than the Republican Liberty Caucus will have a less favorable view on Rand Paul. They'll have fewer things to say in a positive light about Rand Paul. But without further ado, I, I, I think that Libertarians can really so let me set up the groundwork before i finish that specific point that i was going to make 
on Twitter, Rand Paul shared his wife's article, of course, but he especially, he put an emphasis on a certain section of the article where Kelly Paul is talking about um, how we shouldn't throw these people behind bars, how we shouldn't incarcerate them. Instead, we should focus on rehabilitation. So as a libertarian, I think that people can look at that and really feel happy that a senator presiding over a state is sharing this and taking a somewhat radical position on drugs. He's not taking the tough on crime, locking up war on drugs position. Because many have accused Rand Paul of being a panderer and to an extent as a senator or when he was uh, looking for his bid for president, he kind of did pander. But this is something that you got to love Rand Paul for, sharing this kind of radical article from somebody who's not a politician, who's his wife. Although Kelly Paul has has dabbled in politics, but more on the campaigning side. She worked for the Ted Cruz campaign. Anyway, so I, I do want to go over this article. She brings up a very... Or she tells a story of something that I am a proponent of, which is community, community outreach, community helping individuals, looking for answers within the community and even your own state instead of looking to the federal government to help people, to, 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 to take care of these issues that should be taken care of by our culture, by our communities that we're born in, by your neighbors, by volunteerism. Now I understand a bit of tax money went into this, but I, I, I don't have the exact numbers, but rehabilitation is a lot cheaper than incarceration. I would rather just see drugs completely decriminalized and uh, have communities come together, which this article, what she wrote, is praising and telling a story of communities coming together. But I would rather no tax money go to rehabilitation, but as a transfer period, as a pragmatic step, I do like the idea of rehabilitation over incarceration, especially on a state and local level. That is something that I support. So, with that being said, um, it, it is true when you look at the numbers that we spend around $80 billion on the drug war. And the Cato Institute has some, num has some numbers that suggests that if we ended the drug war, not only would we save $80 billion, we could generate an extra, and I, this part is going to make a lot of libertarians apprehensive. Um, don't worry, uh, I'll, I'll add a little caveat to it to make it better or to sell it to you. But the government could raise $80 billion in revenue if they taxed drugs just like alcohol and tobacco. And the reason why libertarians might be apprehensive about that is obviously they don't want to fund the state any more than it already is. And they would rather the government not tax things. And that's something I agree with. But as a transfer period, as a, a sort of a transitional policy, and as a means of paying down our national debt, I think it's a great idea. And maybe using some of that tax money, because in reality, we're saving, we're saving $80 billion, but we're also raising around $80 billion. So that's $160 billion that we're technically adding to our budget. Or, you know what I mean. That we're returning to our budget, I guess. Because the two are contradicting in a way, but it totals to $160 billion. Anyway, whatever. That is beside the point. I think it's a better alternative. And I think it's a good transitional policy. It's not the end goal, but it is there. So, without further ado, let's talk about the cultural ramifications of what Kelly Paul is saying. I don't, I don't think ramifications is the right word, but the cultural um, 
implications that she's talking about here. Or at least her interpretation of culture. She's talking about... She's really coming at this from not only a religious aspect, but also a secular humanist aspect. Something that most people can agree on. We shouldn't punish people for... We should stop treating people who use certain drugs or chemicals like rapists or murderers. What if we stop treating people who use certain drugs or chemicals like rapists or murderers? I don't think it's fair to put these people behind bars because these people who are going behind bars for... who are being locked up by the state, by the government, by people with guns, they're being locked up with people who have taken the dignity away from other people, either by taking their life or by um, completely violating their sexual autonomy, by forcing them to do something that they don't want. And I would even go as far to say that people who commit property theft or property damage are worse than people who use a substance that doesn't hurt anybody else. I'm not saying there shouldn't be consequences for harming somebody physically or damaging their property. If you are on drugs, that should be severely punished just like it would if this person wasn't on drugs. But we're treating these people like they have hurt somebody else when the only thing they've done is taking something that's only going to cause a destruction to their body. And I like the fact that she's stressing, she's praising, she's putting an emphasis on community coming together, uniting, and helping people who need help. Now, I don't know whether or not she she wants to force people who are addicts, but I think force them into rehabilitation, that is. But I do think this is a better transitional policy than taking away people's dignity for falling to a substance. Think about it. Think about the addictions that you have. Do you have a food addiction? Do you have a sugar addiction? Do you have a caffeine addiction? Now, I understand that these aren't on par with a lot of the harder drugs out there. But there are people out there who would love to control the amount of sugar in your food. There's people who want to control the amount of fat in your food. So this, at some level, boils down to individual choices and whether or not you should be punished for individual choices. But I love what Kelly Paul is saying, that as a community, as a state, and as a nation, we must speak in favor of expanded rehabilitation opportunities for those struggling with addiction. It is recovery, not incarceration, which allows people to become productive members of society. Citizens with jobs and families who can contribute make our communities better places to work, grow, and live. It is recovery, not incarceration, which brings hope and peace into the lives of thousands of Americans and their families struggling with addiction. So, and the one reason why I really like what she's saying right here is because she's saying there is an alternative to violence. There's an alternative to using the enforcers of state law to put you in handcuffs and lock you away in a cage against your will. Could you imagine how much of a better alternative it, alternative it is to not put drug users at risk of being killed by police when they resist? Could you imagine how much safer it would be for our police officers to not have to deal with with doing no non drug raids we are the, the if you want a more peaceful society this is one way to do it now i'm not against ostracizing drug use or people who use drugs i'm not saying that we should start teaching that it's acceptable whatsoever but what i am saying is that we can remove a layer of violence to talk about this issue and we should support personal edification over punishment. Somebody, we want to encourage people to actively take 
to actively embark, impart volition to improve their their mental state, maybe even their soul, if you believe in that type of thing, to enliven their ability to think for themselves and be an individual and contribute to community, family, society as a whole. To give people... Imagine if you know somebody who has a drug addiction, wouldn't you like them to see wouldn't wouldn't you like to see them get back on their feet and do something productive or at least something that would cultivate a spark of meaning in their life? And if anything, government aggravates drug problems. The the more you punish somebody, the more they dig their heels in. Not only that, but the government is unable to stop a problem that is deeply entrenched in our culture or a degradation of our society. Instead, they just move the market underground, which makes it even more unsafe for people around. And I think we need to allow people to convalesce and work on edification rather than treating them as if they're animals and locking them in a cage when the only thing they've done is taking a substance that is only going to hurt them. Because you are furthering, you are furthering the process of taking away their dignity, which they're already doing on their own, by using violence, using men with guns to lock them in a cage like an animal. Instead of letting them know that there is help. The only way to treat an addict. The only way to fix the problem of addiction. Is a cultural change. And allowing people who want an escape from it. To seek help without the fear of being locked up. Or taken away by law enforcement. So in case you couldn't tell. This is something I care about. And this is an article I agree with. And as a libertarian. I love that. Kelly Paul, the wife of somebody who is kind of revered in the liberty movement, whether or not there's a consensus about Rand Paul being a libertarian or whatever, it's awesome to see Rand Paul also praising this article, advertising this article on his Twitter page. It's amazing and I'd love to see more of it and I hope we cultivate a conversation about recovery instead of incarceration so we can work on the edification of human society so we can improve upon human flourishing and so we can decrease the amount of violence that is available or that is rampant in our society I think this is the first step in reducing gang violence uh, domestic violence gun crime or just any type of violence in general and this will open up a conversation in our medical industry or medical fields about how to actually treat people and I think this also allows us to take our eyes off of prescribing drugs to people and trying to figure out how to lean people off of drugs and help them find some help them impart on a journey of soul searching in order for them to help themselves without the use of drugs i think this will be important for medical literature this will be important for culture this will be important for human society thank you for tuning in to this episode of logan for liberty i hope you all have a good one